so I hope you're ready for the end of the world. Stick with me, I will show you my bunker. I have a real one. If you're new here, welcome to my great audience. My name is Laure, I'm a physicist, I have a PhD, and today we are going to react to Kurs Gazat's newest video about nuclear war. Mr. President, nuclear missiles will strike our country in 14 minutes. As you know, tensions have escalated rapidly in the past few days. Today's joint Allied aerial defense exercise began just minutes before we detected the launch. A simple misunderstanding, maybe. We assume the sudden attack is meant to neutralize as many of our nuclear forces as possible. But that doesn't matter now. Missiles are in the air, and we can't shoot all of them down. Why? Because intercontinental ballistic missiles are basically rockets launched into space before re-entering the atmosphere over their target and releasing many different warheads, higher and faster than anything you can send after them. <laughs> They start with a lot of very interesting information. I did learn quite a bit about radars and how to detect objects. They start by saying that the planes are already in the air because of an exercise. That's actually super important because military planes can take a lot of time to be ready to fly. So countries kind of have an alert levels. In alert one, the pilots are like playing cards somewhere and the engineers are still making the plane ready. If you have a level 2, the pilots are next to the plane and the plane has already been checked for departure. And if it's like a level 3, you will have the pilot in the plane and everything ready to start, the doors are open and everything like an ambulance would be. And level 4, the plane is already in the air on patrolling. When you see these really important meetings with a lot of presidents or about war conflicts, you have planes that are already in the air so they can very, very quickly intervene. The ballistic missile is kind of true, if you're a bit old, you know about Reagan and the Star Wars project of the 80s. During the Cold War, the US was rightfully very worried about Russia sending a lot of missiles and them not being able to stop them. The thing with ballistic missile is that it's a ballistic missile, so you kind of know where it's going to go and you have some time to stop it. So modern missiles are really more dangerous because they combine ballistic missiles where you throw them like a rocket, with a direction machine, so they can actually avoid some of the anti-missile defense that you would have put in place in the 80s or in the 90s for the Cold War. Here's what we know. Four minutes ago, our new infrared monitoring satellites detected 112 bursts consistent with ICBM launches from the enemy's inner territories. For some reason, only 20 of their 80 underground nuclear silos seem to have fired, so we suspect most of them were transporter erector launches. It's unclear why they didn't use all their silos. They might just not work after more than 30 years, or they might be keeping them in reserve. The fog of war is keeping many things unclear. Fog of war, war is a real thing. It's quite important for large nations and for smaller, one, smaller ones to keep things hidden, because it's a huge advantage when you have a combat. But on the other hand, when you burn a lot of money and you have huge facilities, people kind of get that you have the weapons. So it's always a bit of a game between telling the other countries that you have the weapons, so you can show off and have like strong muscles, or protecting your assets and being ready to be really powerful when a war starts. Command centers, silos, and major air force and navy bases ending this war before we have a chance to act. The enemy's strategic doctrine prioritizes military targets and our nuclear weapon systems, but their secondary targets are our industry and infrastructure all refineries, power stations, and deep water ports, all located near or in major population centers. We won't know the exact casualty count for a few weeks. Deaths from the blast and burns may be a few million today. It's morning rush hour, and there's not much to be done for people stuck in traffic. People in major metro areas can't really evacuate, but emergency broadcasts are being sent out to shelter in place and away from windows. Radiation exposure for intact population centers is highly dependent on the weather over the next week. We might be looking at dozens of millions of deaths by the end of the month. For the now I need to show you one very specific clip from France. Le plus inquiétant ce soir reste le nuage de particules radioactives. Alors, comment peut-on prévoir son déplacement Les explications de Brigitte Simonetta. 
autres. Si l'émission radioactive persistait, tout laisse à penser que cette poussière, aspirée depuis l'Ukraine, serait renvoyée vers l'Italie, la Yougoslavie et l'Autriche. En France, l'anticyclone des Açores s'est développé. La météo affirme qu'il restera jusqu'à vendredi prochain suffisamment puissant pour offrir une véritable barrière de protection. Il bloque en effet toutes les perturbations venant de l'Est. This is an epic piece of journalism. Basically, France decided to claim that because of the Chernobyl nuclear radioactive cloud that went through Europe, it stopped at the French border thanks to winds. The funny thing is that at the same time, Spain, Italy, UK, Portugal, everybody noticed the peaks in radioactivity, except for France. Anyway, back to our Kurzgesagt German documentary on war. Updates. We have radar confirmation that the enemy ICBMs have completed their burn and deployed their warheads. Our best guess is that each missile will deploy at least six re-entry vehicles, about 600 in total, which is the part that carries a warhead back into the atmosphere during its terminal descent onto the target, and with many more decoys on top of that, inflatable balloons meant to waste any anti-missiles. I'm a little skeptical on the balloon as a decoy strategy, because missiles seek out other missiles by using heat map. It's actually the best way to find another plane or something like that. And so... You would need to heat up the balloon so it would have a heat signature that's similar to a missile. I mean, it's an interesting strategy, but usually a lot of people or a lot of plane would like emit, for example, explosive particles that bring a lot of heat and might distract the missile from its main target. Nuclear wars aren't regular wars. They only last minutes. And in times of crisis, small conflicts can rapidly spiral out of control. Anything from small communication lags to sensor errors to just uncertainty in the fog of war mean that no leader will ever have a complete idea of what's happening as a crisis unfolds. Confused and with incomplete information, a single person, yes, it's really just one single person who decides, can literally make civilization-ending decisions, killing hundreds of millions of people in the time it takes to watch a YouTube video. I mean, this story is fiction, but the US does have a nuclear water button. What's not entirely right is that, yes, one person has a final decision and could ultimately say no or yes, but you have a range of officials on information lines that are going to brief the president on the matter. Essentially, the president knows nothing until people come and tell them what the situation is, how much they know, how trained they are. And an effective leader relies a lot on experts who know a lot more than the leader and can actually give you an informed opinion. And decisions are being made right now to build new weapons and missile systems that commit the world to another century of nuclear stalemate. Simply accepting that the existence of nuclear weapons is inevitable might mean their use is inevitable. But the world doesn't have to be this way. The entire argument of this video is based on the concept of game theory. And if you've never heard about it, I encourage you to go and check it out. It's really interesting. But basically the question is, How do you handle many non-cooperative players into a game? And how do you manage to get the best outcome if you're just one player? So let's say you're the US or Sweden or France or Togo. Then how do you, as a president or the leader, manage to navigate this political field to get the best outcome for yourselves or eventually for the world as well? And in the case of the nuclear weapons, the idea is that because you have psychopaths, leading other big nations, you want to have as much weapon and as much military as them so you can like strong guard them into not attacking you. So actually having the weapons kind of makes sure that the people are not going to attack you and not having the weapons means that they could in theory do what the US did to Japan during the war and shock you into losing a war or losing a conflict. Even incremental steps taking apart one bomb at a time will eventually result in a world with none. During the Cold War, the world had over 70,000 nuclear weapons. Through arms reduction treaties, that number is now about 12,500. You have the power to make demands of your leaders, and often this begins with just being aware of an issue. I got a tiny bit distracted. Okay, honest feedback, really like the video. I feel like they could have gotten into more details about this decision-making process, But most of the information is absolutely correct. And with the Ukraine war and the increased tensions, we are getting closer to this type of decisions becoming more important again. Though, to be honest, I don't see many countries wanting to launch so many nuclear warheads because what's the benefit, honestly? And now I'm going to show you the bunker because I'm Swiss. 
and we have a bunker. And now we approach the bunker door. Done. Okay, this is a very Swiss underground. You have bikes, you have a bunker door, you have the small wooden door closing the bunker so we can store stuff safely, and you have a stevie to hang stuff outside. Wanna get in? Let's get in. Ta-da! It's probably not what you thought it would look like. So let me just explain a little bit. We have these wooden structures to make sure that we can easily remove all of the wood and settle in the bunker if we had a war and if we needed to. Somewhere in the back there is some toilet, some water filter, some sources. And because it's a bunker, I have no cell phone reception when we close the big door. What no one's telling you is that everybody keeps their nice wines in the bunker. So if a nuclear war started in Switzerland and we had the instruction to shelter its place, we could just play around with our skis and get very, very drunk while we wait for things to get over.